Speedrunning is often defined as playing a game with the intention of completing it as fast as possible. Runners often ask, how far can we push this game? How far can we push ourselves? Dedicated speedrunners are always looking for ways to save time, from new routes to glitches or different timings. But that search for time save can sometimes come back to haunt them. Like the opening of Pandora's box, sometimes new discoveries make a fun and challenging run impossible making some runners wish maybe these tricks shouldn't have been discovered at all. One game that exemplifies this feeling is Donkey Kong Country. Longtime fans of this speed game will tell you that watching attempts of this game can be brutal. Even watching races, like the ones shown off at Games Done Quick events, can tell you that running this game is hard. Maybe even too hard. Ooh. Oh. In a previous episode of Speed Docs, we covered The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap, which had a cutscene skip glitch that saved two minutes if done correctly. The problem was, the skip was a one-frame trick in a 60fps game, and had no buffering or consistent setup, and lost a minute and a half if missed. It doesn't help that the trick is an hour and a half into a run that's about an hour and 45 minutes long, making it incredibly risky for runners on a PB pace. But speedrunners don't shy away from risk. They charge ahead bravely, always searching for that sweet PB. But in this case, this is only one trick. What if the run had three of these tricks? Would Minish Cap runners still go for each cutscene skip? What if there were seven frame-perfect skips? What if there were more? Donkey Kong Country All Stages has evolved into an incredibly difficult run, with some runners calling it a black hole of effort. But it didn't start out this way. Let's go back to the beginning, when these monkeys first made their grand debut. But I have to warn you, there's a lot of rolling ahead. And I mean a lot. So buckle up, it's gonna be a wild ride. Welcome to Speed Docs. The Super Nintendo Entertainment System was released in North America in August of 1991. When you think of the Super Nintendo, what games come to mind? Super Mario World? A Link to the Past? Super Metroid? Packed to the hilt with memorable titles, the console was a huge success for Nintendo and was responsible for introducing a new generation of gamers to console gaming. Donkey Kong Country was released in 1994 and was very well received amongst fans and critics alike. Developed by Rare, it is one of the most technically sound games on the platform, and boasts one of the most beautiful soundtracks throughout the console's entire lifespan. The game itself is fairly straightforward. As a side-scrolling platformer, the player controls Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong through 40 unique levels. Collect bananas, roll through enemies, and hitch a ride on some animal buddies along the way. When you reach the end, beat the evil King K. Rule before he takes over Donkey Kong Island. While there are many categories for Donkey Kong Country, we are mainly going to focus on all stages. As the name suggests, this category focuses on completing all the levels as fast as possible. This is mostly accomplished by rolling a lot, which is the primary movement tech in DKC. Rolling is faster than running or jumping, and does a better job of clearing jumps and getting rid of enemies than jumping does. To quote DKCSpeedruns.com, any time not spent rolling is generally time better spent rolling. Donkey's always like, it's based on like keeping your roll as long as possible and like uptime on your roll. Like you always want to be rolling no matter what, generally, unless there's something else to do to get a better roll. <laughs> Each enemy that you roll through will extend the duration of your roll as well as increase your roll speed. So if there are a few enemies in a row and you roll through each one, your Kong will hit blazing fast speed as well as delay the end of the roll. Additionally, if you were to roll off an edge, you keep rolling until you hit the ground, and continue to roll after that. Extended rolls, also called extendos, 
are one of the main speed techs for this game. The two Kongs do not play the same. Diddy Kong rolls faster than Donkey and can jump higher. Donkey was designed to be a fighter, as he can kill big enemies in one hit and has an additional ground slap attack that Diddy does not. For speedrunning though, Diddy has all the advantages, and playing with Donkey is avoided as much as possible. The saying goes, if you're Donkey, you're dead. Donkey does have his uses though, as some levels have skip barrels that are only accessible to him. Our story starts all the way back in 1995. The internet was in its infancy at this point, but that wouldn't stop one of the earliest discussions for glitches in the game. Only a few months after the game's release, people were already discovering and sharing glitches online. On March 27, 1995, a game FAQ's guide is posted which details the glitch called Map Warp. On the overworld screen, each level is connected by a line of dots, and you unlock the next section of the path as you complete each level. Normally, these lines connect directly to each level, but there are a few locations where the line stops and makes a turn before connecting to the next level. When you go over this bend in the line with a single Kong, you stop moving for one frame, and if you press one of the face buttons, A, B, X, or Y, the game will try to put you into the level. Since there is no level on this bend, the game ends up placing you halfway through the default level 3-5, Orangutan Gang. In World 1, there are three such bends in the map, and two of them send you somewhere in 3-5. It would still be a long time before anything resembling a speedrun of Donkey Kong Country would take place, but it is interesting to see what people knew all the way back then. There were probably other threads or discussions from around this time, but unfortunately, there isn't much from this time period that still exists today. In the early 2000s, several tasks would be completed for the game by the likes of Alex Penev, Arn the Great, and Tompa. Before any real RTA attempts took place, the tasking community worked out most of the movement and routing. They even found a neat glitch or two on some levels. Yeah, me and Arn played the game a lot together uh, while having Skype conversations most of the time. We just kept trying weird things in the game and kept having fun with it. Yeah, they, I can't remember like everything we found and we don't have, have it documented anywhere, but we found a couple of things. Uh, they're mostly for tasks, as uh, that's what we were into. Unfortunately, these glitches were the result of weird interactions with certain levels. Like on Tanked Up Trouble, it's possible to roll off a tire directly onto an enemy, resulting in Diddy rolling horizontally forever. Or, at least until Diddy hits the next tire just a foot away. Glitches like these were found in a few levels, but they just weren't useful for speedruns. A few years later, around 2004, Tassers Tampa and Arn the Great were messing around together using netplay. On the level Orangutan Gang, Arn ran off a ledge and started a roll on the same frame he landed on an enemy. Purely by accident, Arn and Tampa discovered that the same glitch that could be performed on Tanked Up Trouble could also be performed on any level in the game under the right circumstances. Arn and Tampa immediately went to work to find more places that this glitch could be used. Indeed, yeah. Even having a net play session playing the game two player and uh, on the great did that first one by accident. And uh, then we tried to like look at levels where it can be used to save time. Uh, we looked at like rope bridge rumble and um, oh, what other levels? Like platform perils, the last level in the game. So here's how it works. By performing a roll on the last frame just before walking off a ledge while also landing on an enemy's head, Diddy goes into a weird state. During this state, Diddy can't be touched by enemies, except for the bees, and can move through platforms. Yeah, jump rolls are really simple. You do two things at once, when, whenever the game allows, and you just rocket forward, and you lose a pixel of height every two, 256 frames, and you can go through every enemy except for bees. That's really important. This glitch would eventually come to be known as the jump roll. The Tassers found a few run-viable jump rolls in a relatively short time, most notably in Minecart Madness and Platform Perils. At the time of discovery, Tampa and Arn assumed that it would be unrealistic that the frame-perfect tricks would be useful for RTA runners. The trick itself is a one frame only timing, and um, early on in speedrun, like one frame that's impossible to time it, like you can't do it consistently, so like, why, why even bother to explain it to runners? Keep in mind that the average skill level of speedrunners back in the day was much lower than it is now. This was in the middle of the segmented run heyday, after all. To the Tasser's credit, 
the first world record to use a jump roll wouldn't take place for another seven years. DKC was a quiet game in the early days, and wouldn't see any more activity for some time. Finally, in 2007, a runner named TJP does a segmented any percent run in 32 minutes in game time. While we aren't going to focus too much on this run, there are a few things worth mentioning. The run does not use glitches, not utilizing either map warp or jump rolls, so it's technically a precursor to the all stages category. When I got onto the scene, no one was speedrunning the game. I had found the DKC discussion thread on Speed Demo's archive, which I think was started by Andrew G. Nothing ever became of it, so I decided to try. DKC had been one of my favorite games beside Metroid Prime 2 at the time. Once I started discussing, posting, and running, then I saw other interested parties and other speedrunners. As far as I knew in my narrow view, as a relatively new user at the time, I was the only person trying for submission to SDA. A few years later, the same runner would go back and do another any percent run, this time as a single segment run. Using the map warp glitch, TJP saved himself a big chunk of time. But a discussion sprung up. Should map warp be allowed? You see, map warp wasn't possible on most versions of the game, it was only available to English runners. Unlike most Nintendo games, Donkey Kong Country first released in North America, and then later worldwide. Versions 1.0 and 1.1 have access to map warp, but it was patched out by 1.2, which is the version that the rest of the world received. Because of this disparity, it was decided that any percent would be split into two separate categories on Speed Demo's archive. Any percent all stages and glitched any percent. Finally, in April 2011, the first official all stages RTA run is completed by TJP with the 3711. Good job, DK. Get out of here. And it is done. It has been completed. TJP would use the map warp glitch in this run, but instead of warping after 1 1, he continues normally until he completes 3 4, then goes back to World 1 in order to skip most of 3 5. TJP also completes the first ever jump rolls in a record run, performing the ones on Minecart Madness and Platform Perils, the two that Tampa and Arn initially discovered. Obviously, it wasn't too hard to complete this in a single segment run as initially thought. But these tricks weren't free either. TJP would later lower the record down to a 3648, mostly by dying less often. This time, however, he only got one of the jump rolls in his run, the shorter Minecart Madness one. The run was still unoptimized, so dying less often was a bigger time save than essentially skipping most of the last level. Several weeks later, a runner named Silent Wolf, well known for his Super Smash Bros. melee career, gets a 3616. Silent Wolf doesn't get the better Platform Perils jump roll either, nor does he use Map Warp in his run in order to better compare his times with the Japanese community, who cannot use the Map Warp. Later that same day, a forum thread was posted on Speed Demo's archive by TJP, asking for clarification on the rules for the category. After discussion between TJP and Silent Wolf, it was decided that Map Warp would be banned from the All Stages category. While TJP was in favor of allowing map warp as long as all stages are completed, completing 3-4, then going back to World 1, and then warping to 3-5, Silent Wolf insisted it not be allowed in order to continue to compare times with the Japanese community, who could not perform the glitch. Since the English-speaking community was rather small, no more than two or so runners, the inclusion of even more runners was seen as a larger priority for the health of the run and community. I guess I, I still was really like trying to compare myself to them as best as I could. But in hindsight, they probably should be treated as separate categories as they are today. A few weeks after the thread was posted, TJP would lower the world record down to a 3601. As the speedrun was still fairly young, and there weren't a lot of runners for the game, the route was slowly but surely being optimized. Specific timings for when to roll, when to extend your roll versus when to speed it up, the use of animal buddies, stuff like this was being ironed out, and in the process, runners were getting better at dying less often and saving time off their runs. One last thing to note before we move on is that the game at this time is timed using J-timing, which starts the timer from when the console is powered on. 
Some games, like Super Mario 64, still use this method of timing today. Many games have since switched to starting the timer on file select. This ends what some runners refer to as the primordial era of the Donkey Kong Country speedrunning community. It was around the start of 2013 that attempting to compare to the Japanese community was abandoned. There were already like plenty of differences between the games that the biggest difference being the um, fanfare skip in the US version saves like 50 seconds to a minute I believe being able to skip the fanfare after each stage and you can't do that in the Japanese version that in addition to enemy placements and a handful of different stages just pretty much warranted it being treated as its own thing. The games were different and attempting to continue the comparison was falling out of favor. The community also moved away from Japanese timing. By the end of January, a runner named Klosti would lower the time down to a 35-27. Damn! Klosti's run is solid and shows precise movement in areas that previously gave runners a hard time. In World 4 alone, Klosti saves about 11 seconds over TJP by playing optimally, avoiding getting hit and not dying. Klosti finishes off the run by showing off a new jump roll on Tanked Up Trouble and gets the jump roll on Platform Perils as well and saves about a minute. Unfortunately, this is the last that we'll hear about Klosti, as a new runner shows up just two weeks later who would eclipse our poor Klosti boy. This runner, known at the time as New Age Retro Hippie, who would eventually change his name to Peachy, took the record with the 3522. It was verified at the time, but no footage of this run remains today. The same can be said for his next record, a 3508 on March 26, 2013. Luckily for us, Peachy kept improving the run and would go on to get a 35 flat on May 14th, this time with surviving video footage. <laughs> 35 on the dot. Peachy brought faster roll routes to several levels and saved a few seconds on multiple stages. Most notably, Peachy brought new extendos like the roll on Temple Tempest. Peachy also followed the age-old adage and spent less time walking and more time rolling. Donkey tricks are like, you have to start your roll at this specific part and there's like a rhythm to it, right? So you gotta tap, tap, tap the button at a, at a specific point on the stage and a lot of tricks are like, it, it's kind of difficult to get that down. You kind of just try different rhythms until one works, like different spots to get extendos. On June 11th, Peachy would lower the time down even further, down to a 34.51, by cleaning up a few parts where he messed up movement. Give it up for the true hero guys, Donkey Kong. Yeah, 3.50. 3.34.50. Peachy also managed to hit all three jump rolls in both of his runs, on Minecart Madness, Tanked Up Trouble, and Platform Perils. Peachy had been the world record holder for over four months now, and had saved over 30 seconds in that time span. How much further could the record be pushed? How long would his record stand? His latest record would only stand for eight days. On June 19th, another runner, Garrison, would get his first world record time with a 34-34. It was when I started streaming it more, it kind of picked up more steam, and he had um, runners such as Klosti and Garrison and Mundungu and Minion coming in and reflected. And once they started playing, that happened more in 2013, the game really started picking up steam. And Garrison especially, he rolled in and um, caught up to me and beat my time pretty handily, and a lot of my um, experience with the all stages category in particular was trying to cut, play and catch up for a long time until I hit a higher level of play. With better roll routes, Garrison saves about 9 seconds in World 1 and 6 combined, and saves almost 10 seconds in Torchlight Trouble, where Peachy lost Diddy and had to complete the level as Donkey. Garrison, however, missed the jump rolls on Minecart Madness and lost a little bit of time. In the later half of 2013, the DKC community stumbled upon a Spanish YouTube channel which had videos showcasing glitches from throughout the Donkey Kong Country series. The community noticed that one of the glitches featured in one of the videos was a glitch that they had never seen before, which with a little time and effort, they were able to analyze and recreate. This trick came to be known as the Super Jump. 
Super Jumps, this was found off of a YouTube channel, and it was a DKC glitch hunter. So the Super Jump, you're storing the jump that Kongs do when they get hit and then reach a wall. They usually run off screen when they get hit, but if they reach a wall, they climb up the wall and jump to the ceiling. And you're storing and controlling that jump. So if you sacrifice Diddy near a wall, and then you go get Diddy back with a DK barrel, um, Diddy's gonna run up to the top of the screen, and jump up to the top of the screen, then you get him back and you sack Donkey instead, or afterwards. And you always do an automatic jump in this game when you switch Kongs. It's to like prevent you from falling into pits or whatever. And so during that initial automatic jump, you hold down B, and then you just land on something. And so long as you don't ever do a manual jump, when you bounce off of something, you'll go back into that the last jump that Diddy was in, which was the infinite one. And so the entire time, once you're in that jump, the entire time you're holding down B, you're gaining height really fast. And so you can just jump over stages. Around the start of 2014, the community reevaluated the rules. Since they weren't comparing to the J community anymore, runners questioned why Map Warp was still banned. With a community vote, it was decided that Map Warp would be allowed back in, so long as every level before 3.5 was completed before, just like with TJP's old run. It was also around this time that a super jump was found to be useful in Forest Frenzy. With this new super jump, and the reintroduction of Map Warp, Garrison would be able to get several new world records. First, a 33.54 on February 7th, a 33.40 on August 14th, a 33.38 on August 17th, a 33.36 on August 20th. Eventually, Garrison ended up with a solid 33.23 on October 22nd. Right off the bat, Map Warp saves about 20 seconds so runners had an easy, free time save with the reintroduction of the glitch. On top of that, the super jump in Forest Frenzy saves another 24 seconds over the normal route. Coupled with the smaller super jump on 2.5, the new trick saved an easy 50 seconds over Garrison's 34.34. To top it all off, in his 33.23, Garrison gets the better jump roll on Tanked Up Trouble, with the Kremlin setup instead of the Vulture setup. Because this jump roll can be performed earlier and doesn't have to wait to avoid bees, it saves another 12 seconds. But this trick is significantly harder than the vulture jump roll. So like, if you know how a jump roll works, uh, you need to initiate a roll in the same frame as you land on an enemy. And like for most jump rolls, like you bas that, that, that's basically all you have to do. Like you just press Y on the right frame, and if the setup is correct, then that's that. But for Kremtut, it's just like, it's a, it's one third of the battle. Because of the spot where you have to initiate the jump roll is, you, you, it's located between two platforms, the uh, moving platform that you're uh, usually riding in 6-1, and the platform on which the Kremlin stands. So if you hit the jump roll, you have to wiggle very quickly to make sure that you do not land afterwards on either of those platforms. Wait, like wiggle long enough to make sure the moving platform moves past you and then you can start going right. And afterwards you have two Bs, two vertical Bs that you have to skip. And those are also really tight to skip. In July, 2014, Garrison would run all stages at SGDQ 2014. While this was one of many appearances at Games Done Quick for the Donkey Kong Country franchise, this is the first official all-stages run at GDQ. Garrison closed out his run with a 3651. While most of the run went well, he unfortunately messed up the jump rolls in World 6, and died a few times in World 4. For a marathon run though, it was pretty thrilling nonetheless. Donkey Kong Country made another appearance at Summer Games Done Quick 2015, with an all-stages race between Garrison, Eason, and Peachy. The top three runners were all gathered in one location. Garrison, the world record holder for the last year, Peachy, early runner and consistent top player, and Eason, a newer face to the community, but a rising star nonetheless. The race was close with deaths, level restarts, and backup strats. Watching these marathon runs really puts into perspective just how difficult this run is. At the time, there were three jump rolls, and even with the three best runners in the community, only one runner was able to get a single jump roll. Garrison got the tanked up trouble vulture jump roll, but lost his time due to a death and platform perils. P. 
Peachy missed the jump rolls, but played smooth and steady in World 6 and was able to snag the victory. The runners ended up with times all within a few seconds of each other. Over the course of 2014, Garrison had lowered the record by 50 seconds. His run would not be easily beaten, and as a result, his 33-23 stood for close to an entire year. To date, it is the longest standing world record in Donkey Kong Country 1, standing for 341 days in a row. It wouldn't be until September 2015 that Eason, the runner from the three-way SGDQ race, would get a time of 33-21, just beating the previous record by two seconds. Garrison's run was good, but it had a few flaws. In Manic Mincers, Garrison loses Rambi the Rhino early and has to finish a larger part of the level on foot, losing several seconds. He also failed the final jump roll on Platform Perils, losing even more time. Eason was able to match Garrison's pace for a majority of the run, apart from losing several seconds due to re-entering the water level Poison Pond in World 5. But for World 6, Eason held it together and finished strong, barely beating out Garrison's time. That's it. Yes! Oh. Three days later, on October 1st, 2015, Eason would go on the run of his life. Again, he had a strong early game and cruised through the run at optimal speeds. Eason was determined, and a bit lucky as well. He made no major mistakes. In tanked up trouble, Eason went for the Kremlin jump roll and saved 12 seconds over his previous run, which used the Vulture jump roll. He even clutched out the jump roll in platform perils and claimed a solid victory. Oh my god. <sighs> No. <laughs> Eason's run was the best case scenario. No deaths, no loss of Diddy, optimal boss RNG, first try super jumps, and both of the best jump rolls. This was it. Eason walked away that day with a 32.59, finally breaking the 33 minute barrier. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> but where can we go from here? It, it definitely was monumental. I, I know Eason thought the run was unbeatable, and it kind of was. I mean, there was some strats he didn't do then. Some minor stuff that you could save a couple seconds here and there. It, it was definitely one of those runs that would be very, very hard to beat. Still managed to yeah get the record in October. And I think it was, yeah, I got 32.59. And that was quite um, quite a good uh, time at the time. It was optimized for like for then, but now you'll notice that segment times have gone down like quite a lot. Movement has tightened up a lot and there's like a lot of like just little optimizations in like pretty much every stage. But with what we had, it was um, it was quite a good run. I think my sum of best was 32.57 when I started the run, and then I got 32.59, so. Eason's two runs would mark the beginning and end of records for Donkey Kong Country in 2015, and what would ultimately end up being a quiet year for world records in the all stages category. Hot off his world record, Eason ran all stages at AGDQ 2016. Showcasing the brutal nature of the run, he managed to pull off some of the harder tricks, like the Kremlin jump roll on Tanked Up Trouble and the shorter jump roll on Misty Mines. Overall, the run was well received and the couch commentary was filled with some of the best and most knowledgeable DKC players in the community. The next run to take world record would have to play perfectly, right? Shortly after AGDQ 2016, someone had a thought. What happens when we combine a super jump and a jump roll? Does it do anything? This question would alter the course of history for Donkey Kong Country speedrunning it would mark the opening of the proverbial Pandora's box. Tasser Rainbow Sprinkles asked this question, and the community discovered that setting up a super jump and then performing a jump roll would result in a new type of jump roll where the player could get infinite height by holding B. This eliminated the issue of jump rolls running into terrain, or B enemies, as Diddy can now soar over top of everything in the stage. Additionally, much more like a traditional roll, Diddy can hit enemies after the start, allowing him to gain roll speed up to three more times, making this type of jump roll significantly faster. This trick would come to be known as the Super Jump Roll, or SJR. 
Yeah, it was your mind is one of my streaming sessions. I was playing the game. I, I can't remember if I was testing it or doing something else. And um, Rainbow Sprinkles, like she, she asked in the forum, saying in the chat that, uh, what happens if you combine the super jump and the jump roll? And I kind of made fun of him, like, oh wow, that that, that doesn't work. Like we we tried that pretty much. Like there's no way. And I did it on the stream, and wow, this this happened. <laughs> so you combine the two glitches, and you can roll through the air, going upwards, and skip the entire level. And it was really cool. And he was just dabbling in a lot of things, right? And so nobody had ever tried to do them, like set up a super jump and then do a jump roll. And so it happened while everyone was away at AGDQ 16. And that completely changed the game. Some runners saw the introduction of more frame-perfect tricks as a bad omen and wanted super jump rolls banned from the start. People were kind of split between allowing them and not allowing them. There's actually quite a heated debate over it on uh, the IRC channel. Before, dis there was no Discord at the time, so we all just, we just had IRC. And um, there were some, there were valid arguments on both sides, but in the end, we, as you well know, we allowed the super jump roll. But um, myself and a couple other people were trying to push for um, not allowing them just to preserve like the integrity of the game, I guess. Not to have like every single stage have one of these tricks and be more based around like movement and actually playing the game, which is what I've always enjoyed about the game. So I I was an advocate for for banning the trick, but in the end it was allowed, and um, I'm glad it was allowed. Looking back, but okay. I was I was definitely pretty was pretty salty about the whole thing because you know you get this awesome time and then a few months later it's like bam now there's like a whole minute of new time save come along. So it was pretty bittersweet for me, that's for sure. They just, yeah, it just comes down to really, I mean, progress. You know, you're not just gonna halt progress because you don't like something. It's, you kind of just have to accept it for what it is. In the end, it didn't make sense to allow both tricks individually, yet ban the combination. Progress was not halted for better or worse. Immediately, the community started to look for potential places to perform SJRs. Previously known jump roll spots and super jump spots were reevaluated to see if they could be utilized. If a jump roll previously hit B's or solid terrain, it was considered not worth the effort. Now, with the super jump element, Diddy could bypass those barriers, making jump rolls like the ones in Misty Mines actually useful. Yeah, the big difference that made super jump rolls open up so much more was that you no longer had a height requirement, so you can't gain height or anything. And once you touch the ground on a, in a jump roll, you land. So if it wasn't in a good location, it was you could get it, but it was useless. Pretty quickly, three SJRs were found to be easy enough to set up and save significant time. These were found on Forest Frenzy, Oil Drum Alley, and Misty Mines. A month or two later, a fourth SJR on Rope Bridge Rumble would also be found. With this super jump roll on Rope Bridge Rumble, the number of frame perfect tricks is now seven. The Forest Frenzy super jump roll, the Rope Bridge Rumble super jump roll, the Oil Drum Alley super jump roll, the Minecart Madness jump roll, the Tanked Up Trouble jump roll, the Misty Mines super jump roll, and the Platform Perils jump roll. All runs from this point in history can essentially be boiled down to these seven tricks. By using super jump rolls in stages Forest Frenzy and Misty Mines, Eason would get a 32-47 on March 10th, 2016, shattering his monumental record from October. Eason pulled off two SJRs and yet failed the jump rolls on Oil Drum Alley, Minecart Madness, and Platform Perils. Still, the SJRs are so fast that Eason is able to break his highly optimized 3259. Nice, dude. There it is, man. Eason later got a 3240 on March 20th, this time hitting most of the frames, only failing the Misty Mines SJR and Platform Perils JR in World 6. Going into World 6, Eason was 20 seconds ahead of his PB but failing the last two SJRs lost him most of his lead. At this point, every level is crazy optimized. Most runs are plus or minus one second by the time they get to World 5. The only real variation is which jump roll tricks are achieved. 
relatively speaking, in in my personal opinion, I feel like DKC is quite an easy game. I have, the movement is um, the movement's great and it's hard to master, but it's a very linear game. Like every stage is just left to right. There's not much verticality involved, and it's really just all about maximizing your roll distance and minimizing the time spent not rolling. There's a hard skill ceiling with this game because you can only go so fast. Whereas like, you know, games like Super Mario 64, the skill ceiling is quite a bit higher. So there's quite a bit more variance. Not to say that DKC is an easy game, but um, there definitely is a hard ceiling. And I feel like a lot of us in the community have reached that point now. And that's why you'll you see less and less variance in between the top runners. Towards the end of 2016, Eason would lower his time down to a 32-33.6. I did it. <clears throat> Eason lost time on Forest Frenzy by missing the jump roll but getting the super jump, and some more time on Oil Jump Alley for not getting max speed on his SJR. He also failed the last jump roll on Platform Perils, but nailed the Misty Mind Super Jump Roll and tanked up Trouble Kremlin Jump Roll. This record would stand for the remainder of 2016, and wouldn't be broken until May of the next year, where it would be broken by none other than Eason himself. On May 25th, 2017, Eason would squeeze out a small PB, lowering his time down by 0.6 seconds, down to a 32-33 flat. Even with most of the other jump rolls, Eason lost plenty of time to the Vulture Jump Roll on Tanked Up Trouble. Compared to his Kremlin jump roll from last time and not getting the Oil Drum Alley jump roll, Eason barely caught up to his previous best. Getting the final jump roll on Platform Perils was enough to give him a small lead and secure the tiny world record. Now, normally, Eason's run have a pretty good shelf life, but unfortunately, another runner was hot on Eason's trail. Inspired to hop back into the fray, old school runner Peachy cleans off the old dusty controller. Only four days after the 32-33, Peachy would land a 32-19, being the first person to use the super jump roll on Rope Bridge Rumble. Four years. Four fucking years. Peachy's run also lands all the frames, except gets the vulture jump roll on Tanked Up Trouble, and misses the shorter jump roll on Minecart Madness. With this solid improvement to the record, Peachy would hold the title once again, this time for 11 months. Around the time that Eason got his 32.59 back in 2015, two new up-and-coming runners joined the community. These runners were Fathlow23 and Void. Having started in the age of the SJR, these fresh faces were maybe more comfortable with the trick than other runners. In the wake of Peachy's 32.19, Fathlow would be the next runner to break into the upper echelon of DKC runners. Fathlow23, on the 23rd day of April, managed a time of 32.15. <laughs> even though he missed the Oil Drum Alley SJR, Fathlow hit all the other frames and even got the Kremlin jump roll. With a few small optimizations as well, Fathlow's run was looking solid. Three months later, Eason would return to take the record from Fathlow with a 32-13. Eason missed the Rope Bridge Rumble SJR and only got the Vulture JR in Tanked Up Trouble, but he hit everything else. The competition was heating up. Several top players were back in the mix, and the record was anyone's game. But runners were frustrated. With so many of these frame-perfect tricks, it was almost impossible to get them all. No matter what you put into that game, once you get to high level, like extremely diminishing returns as you get better. It's, so it's not a very um, rewarding game to play at high level because it's much more punishing than it is difficult. So it doesn't feel like you're over, you know, like overcoming like very difficult tricks. Like you just need to piece everything together. It's like, well, I lost another 100 runs to the frame today, like or something. And of course, it's not easy either. So like, you're not going to get every run to that point. It's there's an imbalance, severe imbalance. A month later, on August 11th, Void also joined the elusive club of world record holders, obtaining a 3212 as his ticket in. 
Grandad fucking saved the run! Ooh, got him! <laughs> Void missed the jump rolls in World 5, but redeemed his run with the Kremlin jump roll in World 6. But the run was getting too optimized now. Soon, it would be impossible to beat the record without getting every single jump roll. Sub-32 was possible. Now it was just a question of who and when. Every good runner has a mid-31 sum of best, and everyone's capable of it, but it's just a matter of, like, suffering <laughs> through that soulless grind. That person would be Fathlow, who would finally get the record back on October 4th with a 32-10. Fathlow almost had a perfect run. He hit all the jump rolls, had no deaths, and had decent boss RNG. He messed up the Misty Mind super jump roll and didn't get the fastest roll speed, meaning he loses around 11 seconds because he only rolled through 3 enemies instead of 4. Managing to get the Vulture jump roll on Tanked Up Trouble, Fathlow was at least able to take the world record. Runners were approaching the apex once more. The only thing left to do was to secure the ultimate run. With both the Misty Mind super jump roll mistake and the Kremlin jump roll, there was still a lot of room for a sub 32 minute time. <laughs> yeah, if I, if I got Kremtut on this run and everything else played the same, missing the two snakes, it still would have been 31. That's crazy. A month after the previous world record, Fathlow takes up the mantle and does some attempts of DKC. His play is solid, his technique practiced. One by one, world by world, the major tricks come and go, conquered. Forest Frenzy? Nailed it. Rope Bridge Rumble? Killed it. Oil Drum Alley? Flawless. On this crazy pace, Fathlow drops the Kremlin jump roll on Tanked Up Trouble, but brings it home with the Vulture setup. He gets the optimal speed for the Misty Mines SJR, and flies to the exit. Tensions high, knees weak, arms heavy, Fathlow secures the Platform Perils jump roll and rides the train to victory. Yes! <laughs> Fuck yes! With the solid follow through, the bosses are defeated and Fathlow finishes the run with a 31.59, the fabled sub-32. <laughs> oh my god. The chat cries out, the end of an era. I was just like, hallelujah, the, the, the demon is dead, everyone can move on maybe. The community rejoiced. Someone had finally done it. The 32-minute wall was torn down, just in time for a victory lap at HDQ 2019, where Fathlow, Void, and Stu were slated to race all stages on opening day. For marathons, runners are often encouraged to practice their games to keep their skills sharpened and knowledge fresh. But during one of these practice sessions, Void gets on a pretty crazy run. One after the other, the jump rolls fall before him. Nothing can stand in his way. Void would follow in Fathlow's footsteps and would hit every jump roll in the run, for the second time in history. Yes! <laughs> what the fuck, dude? <laughs> well, sort of. At the end of November, a new trick was discovered. It was possible to store a super jump in such a way that rolling off a ledge could activate a pseudo super jump roll, essentially skipping the need for the frame perfect timing. This trick would come to be known as the Super Free Roll, and was considered a godsend for eliminating the SJR from Misty Mines. Uh, so that, that one replaces the uh, Super Jump Roll that we used to do in 6.3, at the cost of maybe like a second and a half, two seconds, but like it actually makes it uh, free. It's actually not a jump roll. <laughs> as weird as it sounds so the only thing you do is you set up a super jump and then you have uh, yourself grab a rope still it still in super jump state and then from that rope you uh dismount it and then afterwards because you're still you're still in uh, the super jump state if you initiate a roll off a ledge you will gain uh, the speed of a roll, but you will also gain the height of the super jump at the same time. And so you are basically now in super jump roll state without having to hit a jump roll, which is pretty convenient because you don't have to worry about hitting a one frame window. It's really the best trick that we found in this game, to be quite honest, to eliminate a frame perfect trick, but still have the time save be the relatively the same. I believe it's about one second slower to do the super free roll 
than the super jump roll and it's you know it's not frame perfect it's it's really a godsend with one less frame perfect trick to worry about void completed the game in 31 minutes and 56 seconds on christmas eve unfortunately fathla was no longer able to attend agdq 2019 so void and Stu raced each other for the marathon again in classic marathon fashion Void misses every jump roll except for the super free roll on Misty Mines. Stu, on the other hand, nails several tricks, showing off his consistency. Overall, it was a thrilling display of skill and technique from both competitors, and again, a display of just how hard this game really is. So what does the future hold for our intrepid heroes? Void and Fathlo hit every single jump roll in the game, right? Well, as it turns out, the community has found several more SJRs in the game. The big problem is, runners are reluctant to add more frame-perfect tricks to the run as it adds in more breakpoints to an already fragile run. There are even more, it's just that the more that get added into successful runs, the less people want to do them. <laughs> like, I'd say since Stu is a high-level player, that's pretty new, so he hasn't, he's not quite disillusioned by the game yet, being a black hole of effort. This game has a lot of frame perfect tricks and some of them you can't really justify the, the time save, especially when you're on a good run. Like for example, in World 6, there is a frame perfect trick in every single level. Even in World 3 in 3 3 Forest Frenzy, you can do a sacrifice with SJR there and then do an SJR in the next level, Temple Tempest. The problem with the sacrifice of SJR in Force Frenzy is it's impossible. It's really interesting to see though. I mean, the next world record could have these glitches in it. You know, as we push the game further and further, it's inevitable that people are like, well, I guess we should add another trick. You know, we should add another frame because we've reached that threshold. Right. But then it just gets to the point where you have, well, like how many frame perfect tricks, right? Nine, 10, 11. And then it just becomes so unrealistic that you're going to get them all in one run. It becomes very hard to optimize the game to get, you know, a perfect run and hit every single frame perfect trick. So. Well, there's one in particular that I don't use myself. Uh, other runners do, but uh, for whatever reason, like I just can't seem to hit it. <laughs> so it's uh, the one in it, there's one in five three. It's not that it's like particularly difficult to set up, but like for whatever reason, uh, the window. Like I know it's only one frame, you know, but for whatever reason, it's harder for me to hit that one than the others. Like I'm less familiar with that one, so I would just rather not bother with uh, attempting it and not getting it and lose around like six or seven seconds in the process because I'm so inconsistent with it, right? Like my success rate with that SDR is like probably less than 10%, maybe even less than 5%. Whereas with the other ones, I'm like, I want to say like once every two or three tries, like I'm confident that I can hit them. So like, it's pretty, it's a pretty huge difference, but like the one in five, three, I'm just like, I just don't want to bother with it basically. Donkey Kong Country pushes its runners to the absolute limit of human potential. The run is so hard, so punishing, just the thought of pushing further brings feelings of pain and anguish. But like before, speedrunners never shy away from the difficult things in life. They charge ahead bravely. In time, a new wave of runners will throw themselves into the pit, searching for every last scrap of time that they can save. As history has shown, every time a wall is brought up, speedrunners find a way to break through it. Much like with Eason in 2016, Donkey Kong Country will find new ways to soar to ever greater heights. <laughs>